sir, I would like to ask you to share with us your view of the economy as it is right now. A lot of people are scared uh, because many people have lost their jobs, um, the oil prices, challenge, all of it. And we're wondering where are we headed? What, what's the way out? What can we do to get back to get back on track? Well, you see, um, this is a, a point that brings a lot of pain to my heart because um, in some ways, the Nigerian challenge is self-inflicted. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, the last book I wrote was titled, Why Not? It was published last year. Um, and I expressed some of my fears about how Nigeria got to where it is now. And the central thesis of that book is what I call the complicit middle. Hmm. The middle, the middle class in Nigeria. Okay. Like to think those terrible people in Abuja, in Alausa, and there and there that they ruined our country, they ruined our lives. But they are more guilty, we, in our keeping quiet and allowing mm. those things to happen. So our country was ruined. So let's not point fingers anywhere. It is a complicit middle that mm. must take the responsibility for the failings of this country. Now, we have to be very honest to ourselves. Uh, we like to live in, in um, uh, a suspended belief in Nigeria <laughs> sometimes. Suspended belief, you know, uh, the, the truth of the matter is our country is a failing country. I don't want to say failed state, but it's mm. pretty close to a failed state. And how did we get there? Um, we stopped taking responsibility for what was happening around us. We just came out of the June 12th weekend and there were a lot mm. of reminiscences. On the 12th of June, 1993, I voted. I was living in Victoria Island on a, a Boyade Cole Street there, Bishop Aboyade Cole. My polling station was next to Exxon Mobil. I voted. I got the results. I stayed. The thing was counted. I got the result before I left. I knew the result of my street. Many people around the country did the same thing. Before night was over, those who could collate those figures knew what the results were. Then the usual games started. Three, four days later, I think I left for the US uh, to attend a convention. And I was on the floor of that convention when a Ugandan came up to me and said, you Nigerians, you Nigerians, every time Africa wants to make progress, you set us back. And I thought <laughs> to myself, a Ugandan with Idi Amin, what is he talking about? Because I had not heard that the, it was through him ahead of the annulment of the election. I immediately withdrew from the convention floor and went up to my room and wrote an article that was titled, We Must Say Never Again. I faxed that article to The Guardian. The article was published and it aroused the passion of a lot of professionals in Nigeria. People started writing, look, so what should we do? I then wrote a second article, which I then invited at Tedo Peter's side and another friend of mine, Sam Oni, to co-sign. And that article then led to the founding of the Concerned Professionals. Hmm. As senior managers, I was then, you know, acting chief executive of a major multinational company. We came out on the streets of Lagos. Police beat us up in front of the uh, Western House on one occasion. And when we called a meeting, after they had blocked us from most of the normal places we would normally meet, we decided to call a meeting. Our first meeting was at the engineering close, the conference center, the conference hall there. When we called a meeting, we couldn't find a good place to meet because the state was fighting us. A church, St. Peter's, 
on a journalist street, gave us their hall for a meeting. By the time we were arriving for the meeting, special policemen brought from far out of Lagos, Sokoto or somewhere, were waiting for us. Again, we, we got beat, my glasses flew out, and all of that. And I was in the role of a chief executive officer. The point I'm making is that if, as a generation, we took those kinds of risks so that our country could be right, I don't understand why this generation is sitting and watching their country become a laughing stock in the world. Mm -hmm. To come back to your question proper about the economy. You see, Nigeria is in a triple shock economic crisis. Three shocks. Triple, triple yeah. shock. Yeah. Uh, the first shock, which came before COVID-19, was summarized and captured by Forbes magazine in an article written late last year that said Nigeria was a money-losing machine. That article was a vote of no confidence in Nigeria as an investment destination. Why? The, the way that our politics and our regulators carry on makes it frightening to invest in Nigeria. You can start a business, do everything, and it's, as it's reaching its peak, one regulator will just make one pronouncement that completely scatters your business mm. or takes mm. over your business and sells it to a politician. We've seen it in banking. We've seen it in so many sectors of the Nigerian economy. Um, so the world is now coming to an understanding that Nigeria is not a place to invest in. And that was the point of the Forbes magazine write-up. So that of its own was creating a shock. Mm. And the international community was on the way out of Nigeria as an investment location. Oil prices were already beginning to go south, such that the um, budget of last year, the benchmark was already higher than where oil prices were before the um, COVID-19 then hit and there was a total collapse of oil prices. So that collapse of oil prices was the second shock. The third shock, of course, came from the disruption of global supply chains. How do you manage three shocks like this? You can either see it as calamity. Mm. Everything has befallen us. So let's roll over and die. Or you can see it as an opportunity to solve all the problems, all the bad mistakes you have made in the past. For me, this is a classic opportunity for Nigeria to remake itself. My question is whether the political class has enough understanding, has enough sense of service to the Nigerian people to be able to do that. Mm. Unfortunately for, for us, I doubt that they do. Mm. That's, that's what makes it a real crisis. If it wasn't that they don't have that, then you could imagine that they would pick up on this, begin massive restructuring. But everything is still seen in the eyes of chop and share. Mm. Even with mm. this crisis, people are still looking at where can I get my most, even COVID-19, what can I corner from it? What? So there is a collapse of culture, mm. a fundamental feeling in the Nigerian situation. And so the country is desperate for new, new heroes, new thinking, new... Uh, but you know what? Uh, very sadly, uh, if we don't do something, collapse, total collapse, not just collapse of culture, is inevitable. And the signs have come full. What are the signs? Violence. Mm. Violence everywhere you look in Nigeria is violence. Northeast, Northwest, North Central, Southeast, South South. In fact, the least violated part of the country, the man was speaking, is the Southwest. Even at that, you know, you, you do have uh, 
bits of this violence. So when you have a society in such deep throes of violence, and if you look at the pattern of violence, I was talking to one of the researchers that look at these things a few days ago. Most of the violence in the north of our country is nihilistic in nature. 